um, a fan of the 80s. This is uh, Frank Zappa, and it's Frank Zappa with his uh, Rat Motel. It was a, an album uh, that he made the uh, 80s. Don't ask me what year, I'm not, not sure. Um, that's one example of rock musician uh, with animals. So we've got the rats, and we have Frank Zappa. Right. See some more. So I'm going to show you uh, two more uh, bar reliefs that are still drying. And if we look down here, here we've got Stevie Wonder. And so Stevie Wonder singing, Isn't She Lovely? Uh, the animal theme I am carrying over here is a, an aquarium, and the aquarium is on his piano. If we move over here, this is uh, an older musician uh, who died some years ago from Argentina. Maybe you know him. His name is Astor Piazzolla. And so he played, uh, he was a master of the accordion, and I believe it's, this is called the Bandero, correct me. And I play with it, with the animals. I have actually two animals here. The one that relates best is this little guy, because the armadillo has a scaly, uh, accordion-like skin. It can roll into a ball. Uh, and I felt... Uh, that that related very well with uh, the bandolero. If we move over here, I've got some glaze work. So this is what they ultimately will look like, and I'm hoping to make perhaps 10, perhaps 20 of them. Uh, and this is Amy Winehouse, and <clears throat> she's having an intimate moment with her giraffe. Uh, and uh, I was hesitating whether or not to give her a, a bottle of beer, and I actually have a bottle of beer somewhere, but it disappeared. Uh, but I, in the end, I decided just to have the two of them together. She has kind of a zebra-like striped uh, dress that uh, maybe has some counterpoint with the giraffe. If we move over here, uh, a much older musician, and the hint is being worn by the duck. Uh, if you get this, this would be pretty good. This is Dennis Jop Joplin, uh, very famous uh, singer, uh, bluesy voice, uh, I believe part of the 26 gang, like Amy Winehouse, Jimi Hendrix, they all died, unfortunately, 27, thank you, 27 group, they all died at 27. So we've got Janice and her peace duck, and she's wearing kind of a fancy uh, tie-dye shirt. Now we come over here, come this way. So this was uh, one of the earlier ones, and uh, although it started off uh, as an inspiration from a painting by Gilles Ayo, I, I then decided to fit it into my series, and uh, for my purpose, uh, my main character is now Freddie Mercury, and he is with his cougar at moonlight, and it's another sensual scene. And I try to emphasize the relationship of the mustaches, both uh, uh, Freddy's and the Cougars. So moving on to other uh, subjects, I'd like to show you this one. This is one of my favorite bar reliefs. And speaking about materials, so I would like to show you this here. So here is the catalog of, of the painting by Gilles Ayo. 
So we have uh, an oil painting, and now we're changing medium to a ceramic bar relief, which uh, is, is something that I've rarely done, uh, but I was really uh, uh, impressed and, and by, by Yo's work. And the problematic here was uh, how to how to get the panthers, which are right here, uh, onto my uh, bar relief. So I could have abstracted uh, the, in, the, the the sculpture. But instead, I decided to to create, and then with the glazes, so we can see what looks like uh, a a ledge, a, a possible. Uh, ledge for the the panther to sleep on and i thought that was rather successful so here here the, the amazing thing about clay is that you have both the sculpture aspect the sculpture medium and then you have the painterly medium because you're able to glaze it and that's what makes the business of sculpture uh, I think uh, very special. And I tried to play uh, with the movement that Gilles Ayo, uh does using his brush strokes. He's able to give this idea of movement that the, the panther or leopard is, is moving. Uh, I do it maybe a little less successfully, but I try to interpret that same, same way. So those are some of the bar reliefs, and now I'd like to take you to uh, show you some of the busts. So I've been making these animal busts for some time. Uh, come this way. Uh, this, oh, I found Amy's beer. That's Amy's beer. Uh, a bit early in the morning. Uh, so this uh, is a nice little elephant, and if it wasn't for COVID-19, this elephant uh, would be in Rome today because I had planned to take this elephant uh, to Italy where my brother lives. Uh, because of COVID-19, we can't cross the borders, but there's a, a nice story. I've got lots of stories that's so not so much about materials, but, but uh, there is another elephant uh, in Rome that I made in bronze. <laughs> so. If it wasn't for COVID-19, uh, you'd be looking at the, the bronze one, or you would physically hopefully be here in my studio uh, looking at this work, and hopefully you can come by. I believe after June 12, you guys can come over the border, because I hope to be able to go over to Geneva. Um, I'll make this story uh, a bit short. It's, uh, it happened about it's over 25 years. I made a bronze, uh, elephant at the Institute where I was uh, doing a MFA. And uh, this uh, bronze elephant I ended up giving to my father. So it went down to Miami where he was retired. And when he passed away five years ago, he always said he wanted me to get this elephant back. But it was shipped to Italy only less than a year ago, about six, seven months ago. And that the bronze elephant is now in Rome. And not to leave my brother too distressed without anything, I made him this elephant. So we will have an elephant exchange uh, this summer. We'll see, maybe not. I'll show you a few more of these uh, animals here. This, uh, come closer maybe. This one is one that maybe you'd want to wake up to in the morning. It's my, it's my uh, smiley, sunny orangutan. Uh, and then in terms of material, yeah, I'm using a heavy grout. Uh, I'm trying to recreate the hair actually using tools. So tools and materials are also essential. Uh, stay there a second. Uh, for So 
So, for example, I use lots of wood chisels uh, with clay, and to achieve uh, the hair, I am often using these tools to be able to pull uh, the clay in many directions and, and give it a semblance of, of hair or, or whatever. Uh, we can move on uh, to one or two more of these. But so this is, is my uh, the Borina, sorry, Borina, uh, the wild pig. Uh, she is wearing a Jean Paul Gaultier uh, Madonna uh, a dress that was designed maybe also in the 80s or the 90s. And uh, if you look at her on the website later on, uh, you will see she she's capable of doing some acrobatics. Move over here, uh, I've got a pelican who's in the midst of a small feast. And so the, the playful question I like to uh, ask viewers is what is the pelican eating? not a fish, it's the mermaid. So that's just my playfulness that I, I like to uh, use and storytelling I like to use. Uh, another small story, so here, if you look at this detail here, there's a zipper. I, I used a bicycle gear, might be a different type of gear, uh, to actually push the clay and get a zipper effect. You have to use two of them or go from one side to the other side. And th these are little tricks in using tools to give the material an aspect that yeah, can, be, can be very effective. Uh, one or two more of these busts. This is a, a rhino. It's a bit hard to see from this angle. Uh, its dress is not that fashionable. It's supposedly uh, inspired after a grenade to address the dangerous plight that uh, rhinoceros are in. We go over here. I have a puffin. <laughs> there it is. Not that light. Uh, this is a puffin. Uh, one thing I like to speak and ask people about puffins is how much does a puffin weigh? A puffin weighs, uh, apparently, a puffin weighs the weight of a Coke can. And they're about half the size of a penguin. So they're quite a, amazing, sturdy birds. And I created like a, a harassing outfit, if you will, that um, I got inspired by when visiting a Scottish castle. You have these beautiful gardens where the hedges are cut in such intricate ways. And then one more to conclude my little bust, uh, animal bust uh, series, uh, is the Lieutenant Giraffe. The Lieutenant Giraffe who is apparently sticking out its tongue, but it's not tongue, it's just a leaf. Uh, and she uh, is a lieutenant because she's she's got so these are these are uh, some of the animal busts that I've been making, and I can then move on to show you uh, the Somali man. So this here is still a work in progress. Uh, it's
it's in progress because the idea is that I'm going to multiply yet much further number of balloons and little games will be straight up that, uh, that uh, he is selling. Uh, the shorts, if we just look at the shorts, I, I played with the idea of soulage. I guess I love soulage, and he had a big show. He had a big show recently at the Uber. Uh, so the shorts, I played the idea of the black on black. I'm just uh, being inspired with the slide. The base, I'm, I'm using uh, grog and special uh, mica-like uh, reflective uh, minerals to give it a sand effect. And the idea is that, uh, well, when you go on the beach, you see uh, mostly these uh, uh, people who are refugees, or if they're not refugees, they're really in pretty dire uh, situations because they're just walking these very hot beaches all day uh, trying to sell a few balloons. Some of them are selling handcrafted baskets, which are very beautiful. Some of them are just selling watches and, and Gucci, uh, Gucci glasses, uh, counterfeit glasses. So this is uh, something that I've witnesses, witnessed often because I often go summertime to the beach. And uh, I made a proposal uh, to, a, to a foundation that is under consideration right now that this uh, work uh, is, is, is meant to address that uh, difficult um, working conditions of these people selling objects, knickknacks uh, on the beach. A few more things I can show you are uh, my, my uh, backs. So if we come over here, uh, last year when I was uh, at Webster, uh, I did a, a small reading uh, of a poem, Be Bat or Mouse. And it was pre-COVID, so I apologize if you guys are saying, ah, oh, he's picking up on COVID and bats. Bats are like, yeah, they're terrible. This is actually a pre-COVID uh, project, and um, and the thing about these bats is that uh, this is not fired yet. Uh, they they will have they have these little uh, facet faceted uh, uh, glass pearls. Uh, the idea is the back is hollow, which will allow for a little LED. Then, if we move over here, uh, at present, uh, I think yesterday I finished number 31. So the bats actually are going to be attached to this metal structure, which is a bottle dryer, which, which normally goes this way, and you dry your bottles. Everybody here. Uh, I'm sure has been drying their bottles during COVID. Yeah. Uh, but I'm reversing it. I'm reversing it like this so that my bats attach uh, to these rods. And the example will be that 76 of them actually, they go, they attach to these rods like such. And on the inside, uh, I've got a very long band of LEDs, LEDs, uh, that will illuminate, and then with a chain, it's, it's hung up to the ceiling. So, uh, will it will it truly light up? Well, is it just for Halloween? Uh, what is it for? So that's maybe not for me to say, but that's uh, in any case. For some reason, uh, I got into this project. And so the idea of materials here is essential that I could find. Uh, there are actually many, many different uh, bottle dryers you can find. We've got smaller ones, we've got taller ones, we've got wider ones, we've got green ones, we have all kinds of, of uh, bottle dryers. So I 
found this this was uh, a good size for me. 76 bags. Uh, probably will take me uh, six months to make. You don't count these things. Uh, but yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice project. Uh, I could show you uh, one more. Oh yes, the fish and tree. So speaking about well, two two more things to show you, and then uh, go to the website. Uh, this is the skyscraper zoo. Uh, skyscraper zoo, zoo of the future, uh, where animals can live comfortably, quote unquote, uh, in a, in a skyscraper. The point of interest. Uh, and regarding materials, is this actually these black slabs that are supposed to look like perhaps concrete slabs? Uh, again, what what uh, you can do with with uh, glazing is you can make uh, the glaze matte or or shiny, and it's it's exactly this contrast to me of uh, the matte black uh, platforms with the uh, more shiny uh, glazed walls uh, that makes it come out, that makes it, that makes it um, original. It's really that contrast is even bringing out the depth of it even, even more. And I think that's a technique that's, that's good to follow. During the confinement, um, I had some time, so I went into my basement. Uh, uh, it's, it's not that large, but I have some things that have been stocked for a long time. And it's been actually 20 years that I moved over uh, to this part of uh, the world uh, from Paris. I mean, in Paris, I was in Paris for a few years before I was in New York. Uh, and in Paris, I was uh, doing sculpture some time I was working on fish. So the fish was this thing, I was just thinking about fish. And then uh, I made this series called Fish and Tree. Maybe you guys know Dr. Zeus, and it's one of the pages is, uh, um, goes, a fish in a tree, how can that be? Uh, this, uh, so these sculptures I, I cleaned up, and these were exhibited at the Jardin de Plantes, if you know. There is a, a beautiful garden in front of the Museum of Natural History, the Musée d'Histoire Naturelle, where Buffon, amongst others, uh, studied and worked. And so this was in the garden, except that actually, I unfortunately had to cut the wood. This was uh, over two meters high. Uh, and the wood, after 20 years, uh, on most of these, pieces, uh, you know, just rotted. I couldn't store them in perfectly dry areas. Uh, but here, what it is, uh, speaking about materials and has interested me for, for many years, is, is the ability to, to uh, um, intersect, yeah, one material, whether it's metal, wood, or whatever, with another. So here we have wood that I, I carved and then I'm continuing somehow this line into the clay uh, and and continuing certain corner cuts uh, to really associate uh, the upper clay surface those directly blending into the wood and then I've got the top so that's these are my my fish and here we've got the seahorse uh, over here, I've got, uh, I forgot the name of this little fish. It's actually a little fish that blew up. And over here, this is supposed to be uh, a fox fish. There you go. So it's kind of cute. It's, uh, it's a smaller piece, but it's the way the two materials uh, are associated um, that I think, in this case, works. So sometimes it's nice to clash, right? Obviously, even here, there is, there is an element of clash. 
not fooled. This is not a wood fish, not fooled by the material. But yeah, it's the myth, it's the clash, it's association, uh, which I think is uh, the force. So that's, uh, yeah, that's it. I think uh, uh, we could, I could either take some questions or if you want to go to the, the website, we can, I can show you some things on the web website. Um, it's up to you. Oh, I have one more thing. I didn't show you the best side. Yeah, this guy. Thanks. Show and tell. So this is kind of a fun piece of work. Um, during COVID, I, I did a lot of gardening and I said, well, I could use some more pots. So uh, this is slightly inspired by Giacometti. He, some people think the face is more Julius Caesar, uh, but uh, I believe it's Diego made, it's the less famous brother. So do you know which one it was? Was it Ferdinando? Uh, I'm not sure of the other brother. Uh, the less famous of the Giacometti brothers made furniture. And Look at his furniture. Uh, he made little sculptures, whether it was a table, uh, a chair. He had these little beautiful sculptures attached. So I was slightly uh, inspired by that. And then uh, to show also kind of a fun thing. So some, sometimes this is a commission piece because this is a candle holder for Elke. Uh, so at times I'm making things that are slightly practical. I try to keep them beastie. This is the beastie uh, candle holder. Okay, uh, let's let's uh, go back. So I can take you through my website or take some questions. As, as you like. I think a few people might have questions. Can you hear us? Yeah. Great. So guys, this is, your, your students, I don't know. this is your chance to ask some questions, everyone. Yeah. I, yes, I, I do want to ask a question uh, about uh, some of the work you just showed us in, in the very beginning, because I noticed that uh, those works are kind of uh, you, you were focusing on the relation between animals and people. So you have done it by purpose or you want to like declare some ideas with that? That's basically my question. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really a good point. Uh, all the animals have a, a humanist uh, approach or something human about them. Mm -hmm. That's intentional. There's there's no uh, clear mesh message saying you know you should interpret it uh, that way, but uh, I suppose the scope of of, of uh, making animals have human characteristics is to is to bring us together is to show us the proximity uh, that indeed we we share with animals and so that's. Uh, that's good and bad. You can see actually with the COVID, it seems uh, to be uh, problematic because our, our proximity with uh, wild animals is, is, is too much. Uh, that might be also because of our lack of understanding and lack of respect for their environments. So uh, I'm not a militant. Uh, I have great respect for the environment, but I may prefer uh, if, if I want to send a message, I guess I'm using um, my sculpture with a sense of humor, uh, with storytelling, um, rather than uh, uh, showing, uh, you know, a bloodied uh, or a mutilated uh, rhino. 
Okay. And, and another question, uh, I feel is a bit out of the topic, uh, but uh, uh, do, you, do you think all the works that you've made is kind of like declaring a uh, clear message or is just simply like out of passion? You know, it feels like you want to make something and then you make something. You don't know how and why do you want to make that, but you just make it by your heart. So, yeah. Uh, I am like we all are the products of our environment, just like mm -hmm. at philosophers who speak about philosophy at the time they are they are living, and and uh, I am reacting uh, also in many ways to my immediate environment, but also to the law that I, I am within, and governments, etc. Uh, in terms of um, uh, how these come about, that's, that's a bit complicated. I would say it's true that I need to produce these works in order to get going uh, with the works they, they are almost calling uh, for more, right? So you're, you're on a roll and you made this and then you understand that now that you've made this, well, you have to go ahead and make that. Uh, that's, that's the process. So you have to get into the process. Once you're in the process, like in any art uh, process, whether it's music, whether it's writing, uh, fashion design, that's that's how it works. So you're building one thing to another. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> I had, a, I had also a little question. Um, so it's not related directly to the, to your work, but um, so you said you were in New York before coming to Paris or whatever. And f from what I saw, uh, there's way more artists that works with sculpture in general in New York or whatever that I saw in Paris because I used to live a bit in Paris, so I, I knew a lot about this museum. And so, so why did you decide to move to Paris? Like, was it for personal, like, if it was for personal reason, that's, you don't need to answer me, but like, was, is there an, an, any artistic ro relation? Like, you have big Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't, yeah, it didn't work, like, in some great artist stories that uh, you would go to Paris because it was a center of an art movement. Uh, yeah, that wasn't my story at all, it was a personal story. Uh, uh, Paris, like any major city, is incredibly rich, and yeah, certainly Paris for the arts. So uh, it certainly didn't hurt <laughs> going from New York to to Paris. But you're also right in that, in some ways, well, certainly with modern art, yeah, New York is, is an amazing place, and there's a lot more uh, modern public art uh, in New York. I believe than, than in Paris. Paris also has tremendous uh, you know, artworks everywhere. My inspiration, actually, I would have to go back. Um, my tendency is uh, that I have a great appreciation for museums of uh, history. So uh, that's where, when I was four years old, I was taken to the very famous and the largest one in. United States, it's in Central Park or next to Central Park. Uh, so that's maybe where I had these first uh, you know, fascinations, original uh, uh, interest for the animal world. And in Paris, you've got also the amazing uh, Museum of Natural History. So, yes, I did gravitate I, uh, towards these institutions. Because do you think that, I don't know, it just made me thought of this. Do you think that the place where you will exercise your art might affect, uh, because like, I feel for an artist today, like there's a lot of artists and we we're talking about this in our previous class about how, how can you kind of survive as an artist, like for example, to social media or whatever. Do you think the place has also a role to play in this? Yeah, 
I think uh, certainly it does. And uh, yeah, the case in point is that I, I set up this, this uh, activity uh, workshop uh, in an area which is up and coming, but for the moment it's, it's still uh, far too quiet and dirt. Almost no uh, startup uh, fancy uh, coffee shops like uh, you have all over the place. If, uh, if you were in Brooklyn or uh, maybe even in some place. So, so certainly, yeah, it's it's like uh, unfortunately, art is like fashion. So you you thrive off activity and and galleries. It's the same thing. You. Carouge because in Carouge you've got 20 galleries next to each other, that's the place to be. Um, and the same same would be uh, many cities. But some some areas are much more conservative, so it's it's more difficult. Having that, uh, what, what's, uh, what I think is worthy is considering is, is people who are in difficult situations create. Uh, well, you have the art brute, so you have people creating with nothing, uh, and they're maybe slightly insane, so they're creating out of some subconscious need to create. Sometimes they're creating using, using uh, very challenging uh, materials. You could speak about uh, Solzhenitsyn, who's in a gulag, and he's creating in the camps. Uh, one day, in the life of Ivan Denisovich, and so, so the fact to be in a, a shitty situation or place, one, but not being in the ideal place can actually be good for creativity because uh, you might not have the material. And so you have to do something else that's pushing you to, to find and use something that you normally not necessarily, not necessarily a bad thing. No, I guess I guess we saw that with the virus, like a lot of people were turning into drawing or painting or whatever. So maybe it's, it's a start of something. But, uh... Making bread. I have a friend who's making uh, bread sculptures. <laughs> oh yeah, wow. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. I have two questions. Um, is there is like any element that of art you enjoy working with the most? And the second question is about the smiling face. What is so special about this person? Smiling faces? Yeah, the um the picture that you showed, um uh, I think um uh, one of the that you showed while working around it's close to the to the pig the yeah <laughs> the tank. Uh, well okay in an orangutan and uh, what I, there, there's the expression uh, the nice thing about when you really smile is that you show your teeth uh, and the teeth can the teeth are revealing, they reveal uh, the identity, they reveal your age. Um, yeah, so, and they are teeth, teeth in themselves are, are, are like little sculptures. So, yeah, I actually, yeah, I have an interest uh, in, in sometimes uh, working on teeth, although it's extremely difficult, I don't do it that often, but, but uh, uh, all my little bats, uh, have little fangs. Well, that's not one of that's not one of the giveaways that uh, I suggested at the beginning of this lecture. But um, yeah, I, I, I suppose uh, just uh, the reason of using smiles uh, or, or uh, smirky expressions is is that to me it builds more curiosity. If show something more tragic uh, we can be fascinated by tragedy as as we are we uh, we like to see crime scenes and uh some people are very attracted uh to crime novels and blood and whatnot um, 
as I explained earlier, uh, to me, it's, it's really trying to uh, attract a broad audience. So little kids love my work, but uh, I hope also adults too. My thinking is awful, often that of a little kid. So I try to keep that little kid thinking in the, in the, in the creative process. What was the first question again? The first question was, um, is there an element of art that you enjoy like working the most? When you say element, are you speaking about material? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's become, it's become uh, clay, but it's associated with. So, so clay by itself uh, wouldn't be as meaningful. But the clay has to be to be associated with uh, uh, that it can be associated with space. If you're doing installation work, you're thinking about, hey, where does this go? Uh, how is it going to stand? How is it going to sit? How is it going to hang? So, so uh, the value of, of the work only becomes obvious when, when, when you consider all these factors. Any other question? Thank you. Yeah, I have one. Sorry. Um, no, I was going to ask if there's any specific artist, place, or memory that shaped who you are as an artist today. Well, that's, that's also, a, a, there are many, so it's, it's difficult to, pinpoint just one or two artists uh, uh, because as I, I mentioned, uh, even a uh, Sarah or Sulaj, which is seemingly very, very far from what I'm doing, uh, they are inspiring to me and, uh, and painters are inspiring to me. Uh, what I haven't spoken about is literature. So beyond, uh, I studied literature and early on, probably around the age of 17, I started writing. So I got lots of uh, writing of my own, uh, little poems and, and little uh, stories that I write. And, and to me, that is inspiring for a number of these uh, uh, works. So, there are not there are other artists that have, who use literature. I, I am certain there are, are many. Uh, Tom Otterness, okay. Tom Otterness in, in uh, New York is an artist that I really admire because he recreates lots of fable like stories. He's a bit of an anti capitalist, and he's got a lot of uh, amazing public uh, art bronze so you can check out um, modernists uh, see see what I mean I have a question if I may sure um, I'm curious to know what's the typical profile of your client if it's an art collector or, or not or whatever and how much uh, yeah. the influencing your creativity, or is there any influence because of that or not? Is that a way around? Uh, principally speaking, right, should always be no, the client should not influence, but, but uh, at the same time, clients can be very, very encouraging. Uh, yeah, in my case, it's simple because I've been teaching for many years and I haven't had um, either the time or the success to get uh, a good gallery behind me. Some gallery shows here and there. Uh, I sell a couple pieces of a year, a couple pieces of my work a year, mostly to collectors. Uh, all I can say is that it's very encouraging to sell. If you don't sell, you're really working in a corner. So uh, it's important uh, to be able to get out there. And even, even okay, if you don't sell, uh, Maybe the most important thing is to show, and exhibit. It's, it's like uh, all creation, if you're a musician, a writer, whatever, 
It's the question of communication. If you can make something that communicates to a person, it doesn't have to be a million people. It can be just two people or ten people, whatever. If you're successful in communicating that, I think that's worth it. Sure, we would all like to create something and have 100,000 people love it, and maybe you do that on Instagram. A lot of people are doing that. Instagram is a way to have your own little gallery. People are imitating museum artworks on Instagram, and that too is worth something. Yeah, it was worth, especially during the confinement. Think about all the people having to do. They didn't want to make bread, so they decided to pose as famous works of art. And frankly, there's no money in it, but it's great. I think that, yeah, as we can see with the COVID, that living without culture is dire. So we need to create. Certainly, you can't just create and live off breadcrumbs. That gets more complicated figuring out how to create and pursue your passion without being totally broke. Thank you. But there is the business side, having an agent certainly can make the difference. You have to be pretty savvy today to get out there and show your work. So it can be a connection. Otherwise, yeah, it's more than just talent. In my opinion, you have to be very savvy. Thanks, James. Thanks for the tour and thanks for the Q&A. Thank you for, for sharing with us your insights. It's 12 o'clock, so we're like right on schedule. Um, I'm sort of lining, lining up artists today. So. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Olivia, we have Olivia with us who, who joined a little while ago. I would love for you to stay, James, and uh, see what's happening in a very different uh, creative space from yours. So as you're aware, I've called this little overview of materials from clay to VR. I thought that was kind of sexy. I don't know if that was a complete fail, but I try. Um, so you're very welcome to stay and, and talk to Olivia, who's here with us. I can see you, Olivia. Hi. You're calling in from Montreal. Wow. Sorry if I'm kind of waking up here. It's uh, 6 a.m. So everyone oh. where, where you're all located. Um, so hold on. I'll just switch back to the regular camera. Uh, oh, sorry. One second. Okay, I'm just new to the one sec video. Okay, camera, one second. Okay. So, hi.